All right, howdy folks. Welcome back to Top Comic Compressing. In this video, what we're gonna do is try to give a facelift to this not quite as amazing as we'd like it to be copy of The Amazing Spider-Man number 238. For those of you that aren't aware, this copy is, or this issue is famous both for being the first appearance of the Hobgoblin, one of the best and greatest villains in the Spideyverse. Uh, conveniently enough, if you're looking for a little nugget of trivia, that villain was also voiced by Mark Hamill in the 90s cartoon series. As soon as I tell you that and you go back and watch it, when you're viewing it, all you're going to be able to hear is the Joker from the Batman the Animated Series because it's the same voice, uh, which makes it pretty awesome. All right, so this particular copy has got a number of issues, but one good thing is it does have the tattoo insert. And so for those of you that are trying to find a, quote, complete copy, you know, you need this insert. For those of you that follow the channel, sometimes you can uh, go ahead and get that insert added if you happen to find an issue that doesn't have one. Technically, that's marrying the insert. Uh, in practice, it's very hard to tell that apart. It's much easier to marry the insert than a page or a wrap because it's connected only at one staple. All right, this particular issue, though, has a number of issues, mostly this kind of nasty watermark that is on the interior front cover and the interior back cover, and it's plainly visible on the back. It also has an extraordinary amount of foxing as we go through here, and you can see in general it's discolored, including having some hair there. So uh, we're, what we're going to try to do is give this one a, a facelift, and that's going to have to take a couple of forms. So for a book that has this many issues, uh, one thing that we're going to start with always is our dry clean. So that'll be step one. Step two is going to be a, a spot hop on those watermarks, both on the front and the back cover. Step three then is going to be a good amount of our blue light hydrogen peroxide overlay treatment and that's going to be targeting this foxing as well as any residual staining in here and we might have to do some misting uh, on this book depending uh, i'd like to try to do the overlay whenever possible but particularly with these stains the mist method seems to be a little bit better and so we're going to try a couple of uh, overlays and see what, how that looks and then we might have to resort to a mist uh, and then there is some damaged gloss on the back here that i might try to revive with our buff and polish method. Whew. And then after all of that work, we're gonna finish this up with what will hopefully be a single final press. Now, when pressing these with the tattoo inserts, uh, in principle, you wanna add more buffer between the back cover and the tattoo packet. Uh, in this particular copy, the tattoo is snugly up right in there and you can kind of see that line in the glare there. So there's a little square of a tattoo in there. I actually don't do that. And some people might argue with me that that's sloppy or lazy pressing. But if you look at it on the back cover of copies of this that are native in the wild and not married, you get a nice uh, line here from where that insert is. And you can see a very, very faint, but very real box right there in the glare. And I try to make sure that that gets preserved because I think it adds authenticity to um, the placement of that tattoo in the packet, right? So that's something, even if you change out the packet, you can't change out the location of the tattoo in addition to the packet. So I actually try to leave a little bit of an insert shape and, and distortion in that gloss on purpose, and I've never seen CGC mark it or mark a book down for it. Okay, so that's the game plan here. Let's go ahead and get started with some of our dry cleaning. Here's my, my eraser. And we're just going to gently go down the newsstand here. The good news is this book doesn't have a ton of white to worry about uh, on the front cover. Um, most of what's up in the 60 cent box is actually foxing and discoloration. So we don't have to worry about that. Just going to go ahead and flip this on over and start here on the back. And you can always tell if a book was properly dry cleaned. Typically, the easiest spot to tell is right down that rear spine. Uh, that's where it ends up picking up the most crud and typically becomes the most visible. This one has mostly non-dirt marks here, so we're not getting a whole lot off here with the dry clean. Most of this stuff is foxing, and actually I might just stop the dry clean here. There's not too much to worry about. Let's be quick. Yeah, let's see a ton up here. Generated a few racer marks by uh, 
polishing. So remember when you're doing this, typically if you do it incompletely, you'll leave streaks where you've kind of polished and you just need to even that back out. Yeah, so I think that's it for the dry cleaning on this one. So if you come on back here in a second, I'm gonna grab the iron for the spot hop and we'll get that a process of going. All right, here we go. We're ready to get our spot hop process going. So here I have my spot hop mix. This is a, just a makeup remover bottle that has kind of a nice pump action going on. So you can leave a little bit of a pool up top. And then uh, what's in there is store-bought hydrogen peroxide diluted 50-50 with water. Uh, people have asked me about inhibitors in the hydrogen peroxide. And if you have to get inhibitor-free hydrogen peroxide to do this so that you don't leave traces of the inhibitor around, um, that is an excellent question. From my quick reading, which by no means is, you know, as detailed maybe as it should be, the two most common inhibitors are either hexene, which would be a very difficult molecule to detect because it's low molecular weight and it's really there for the alkene. Um, and that molecule happens to, for a variety of reasons, to be very difficult to detect. So I don't think that that's going to be something that comes up. The other one that's the most common is phenol. And phenol is a really wonderful radical trap, uh, but it also happens to be a very com common component in lignin. And lignin is one of the ingredients that are used in pulp to make paper. And so if you analyze paper for phenols or phenoxy groups, you're going to end up finding a whole bunch of them just from nature of it being paper. And so I don't think that that's anything we have to worry about. Not only that, most of the phenol probably evaporates out as well. So uh, I haven't worried about it and I haven't seen different results with and without it. Now this book is going to be dangerous to do the spot hop on and it does have um, that wave here through the color. And I really don't like doing this um, on really colored areas because you can have ink lift. And ink lift is by far and away the most likely uh, defect that you're going to cause when doing spot hop is you'll peel this off and you're going to see a whole bunch of ink right from here. And so you can end up with uh, patches of dead ink from, you know, just the spot hop process. And so that's kind of gross. So what we're going to try to do to prevent that is two things we're gonna actually, well, three things. I'm gonna use less moisture than I might otherwise uh, do. So I'm gonna try to keep it a little bit drier. Uh, I'm also gonna turn my iron down. So usually I have my iron at about 1.5. I'm gonna dial this one back to about 1.2. Uh, so a significant reduction there. And then the last thing we're gonna try to do here is um, not apply as much heat or uh, pressure when doing this. And we're just gonna try to hope that the hydrogen peroxide itself uh, can can do the work. And hopefully if that's the case, we'll be able to, you know, remove some of this tide line without, uh, without pulling any color from the front. And it's going to be delicate though here. It's, uh, it's my favorite thing to do on white areas on back covers along top open edges. It's much uh, more nerve wracking anywhere near the spine very difficult. Anywhere in heavily colored areas, also um, very difficult. That being said, the exact gloss construction from the 80s, I think, tends to be some of the most workable and most flexible. And so I'm optimistic here. I would not be doing this with, say, a <clears throat> heavily colored Silver Age book. Uh, it's just a different, different kind of gloss. We can see some of it transferring. And again, with the spot hop here, you're not going for the home run. We're still going to see this tide line. What we're trying to do is just get like, you know, half or two thirds of that stain out, three quarters. Uh, and that way the blue LED can do some of the hard work later on. delicate ones going top down here. Uh, I think I've said in my other spot hops, you don't want to do this from the top and the bottom at the same time. That's for sure going to be a bad day. I can't even really see the stain here too much on the top down. So, I mean, I can see it kind of over on this blue area, uh, right where it's part of the Spidey costume, but the background, not so much. Again, I'm just going to try to dab up as much of that moisture 
with the kind of dry under the Q-tip. Yeah, and you can see it right here under, under that black shadow, I can see it. There we go. It's gonna be there though. All right, this one we're gonna do like three banana and then peel. I remember that the, we're clean there, so that's kind of what I'm going for. I remember the trick is if you feel anything sticking, you wanna kind of saturate it and let it drop out. But it definitely is coming through the front. But I'm not feeling lucky today, so we're just gonna... Try it on the interior a couple more times and then hope that the blue light can take care of the front. Can blast the back a little bit, a little bit more. But I think this copy will get some heck of a I got a facelift. It looks quite yellowed, quite heavily foxed, quite tanned. Uh, I did consult with the owner before starting on this, and uh, one of the things the discussion, you know, was considering how this book would grade right now as is um, versus after the work. And there aren't any major creases or tears on this comic, and so there's not a whole lot of other damage. So I think for this particular issue, the extent of the staining and the foxing and the tanning actually is the grade limiting. Um, defect. And so because of that, I think, you know, doing these, risking the, the spot hops and the bleeds and things uh, really is the best risk to outcome ratio and best value proposition. You know, it's not worth doing this if, you know, there's a four inch crease right across the top back cover and a tear down here or something like that. But since we've got no major creases, no tears, the spine looks pretty good overall. You know, I think that this comic, even with some light foxing remaining and a little bit of light staining, it might go from about what I'd estimate at the moment to be like a 5.5 five grade, maybe a 5.0. Oh. I think it could get close to a 7.5 or an 8. So I think it's, it's worth doing the work. But I do think that, you know, considering the grade kind of as is after a press and then the grade you know, after the work, imagining both of those comics and kind of cross-grading them is a really important thing to be doing um, before you just dive right in. Um, that's especially true for low-grade books. So if you get to some Silver Age books that may, might be in that three to four grade range, yeah, you got a nice big glob of brown there. So that's probably about as much as we're going to see come off here with the spot hops on this. Um, but, you know, if you have older Silver Age books, that might be grading at a 3.5 with some light staining and light foxing. You know, if you fix all that and there's a bunch of creasing or a tear or something, you know, you might not even see any grade bump, not to mention uh, one worth really the, the trouble of all the work in addition to the CGC fees and grades and, and the risk to the comic book. Now, if you're doing it just for eye appeal because it's part of your own personal collection, you know, that's one thing. But if you're trying to... Know, flip it or whatever it's another thing to consider but definitely worth stressing out that prefrontal cortex in my opinion big deep stain. We're getting stuff. And it's slow and steady, but I mean, you can see the see the brown there, see the brown over here. Flip it over from earlier. I'm get a little bit, like one, two, three on this sheet. This sheet's got a couple, especially over here. You can see that kind of brown in the. Unfortunately, the glare is quite bright, but it is coming off a little bit. And again, with the spot hops, the goal is not a hundred percent. I mean, the first. Bunch of times I tried this, I kept trying to 
you know, keep going and keep going and keep going to get it all. And I just don't think that this technique is really capable of getting it all uh, without doing a lot of damage to the paper. But these smaller treatments, you know, five or six treatments, I've gone up to a dozen, and really after about a half dozen, there's really no marginal benefit to going to a full dozen. Just do two more here on the back cover. And then we'll call it and then we'll head to the light box. So try to get that to soak in for a few seconds there. Still getting a little bit though. That line's got a little bit of orange to it. So that's good. Let that hang out. Hopefully this one will make some good before and after pictures. All right, I think that's gonna be about it for the spot hopping here. We can always do a few more spot hops after the blood box. And so we'll touch base after we do that. If you're looking for more info on um, the blue LED box, I've got a couple of videos, both about where I got my bulbs from, how I constructed the light box, uh, and I'll slowly be putting one up on how I set up my overlays. So check all those out. All right, howdy folks. I just wanted to take a time out here to give you an update on this amazing Spider-Man. Um, this comic, since we saw it last time, has gotten a total of 10 blue LED overlay treatments. One zero, so it was three on the front cover, three on the back cover, um, two on each interior cover, and so that adds up to 10. Uh, as you can see, the colors are now uh, quite a bit brighter. It does have that characteristic wrinkle uh, to it, and of course, we've seen that that'll come out at the final press. The box here is quite a bit brighter. Um, the corner here, I think, just does not compare. You know, that was quite yellowed before, and it looks really, really sharp now. Uh, beforehand, there was quite a bit of foxing on the back here, and all of that is cleared up. Uh, unfortunately, what has not fully cleared up is uh, that staining down here. So it looks quite a bit lighter than it did. And if you look on the interior covers, you can see it's still there as well. So a little bit on the interior front and a, um, you know, a little bit less, but still visible on the interior back cover as well. So the question is what to do about it now. Uh, I'm not gonna give up yet. I'm gonna go from the blue LED overlay. I'm gonna transition to the blue LED misting method, and I'm going to attempt to do two more mistings on each uh, cover for a total of eight more treatments. So we will see how that goes, and we'll have to check back on then. Uh, unfortunately, these little bit more intense tide lines uh, can be really pesky to get fully out. We'll see if we can get it at least looking okay. So stay tuned for that. All right, howdy folks. One more look at this amazing Spider-Man number 238 before it goes into the press. So you'll notice now after some additional misting, this thing is even wrinklier. Uh, it's part of the reason why I try to do the overlays instead of the wrinkle, although I'll cover that in more detail in another video. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is the, the stain now, at least from arm's length, is essentially all gone. You can see, um, you know, it was kind of through this whole area and it looks essentially fully removed. If you open it on up, the interior cover now has, you know, a very similar outcome. It's nice and bright in there, and there's no clear tide line. Um, the same thing is going to be true here uh, with maybe a very light residue 
uh, down there on the bottom. You might be able to just see a little bit of where that stain was, uh, but certainly it is vastly improved from where we started and even vastly improved from where it was after the overlay. Uh, compared to where we started though, I mean, this book was quite yellowed. It had intense foxing all the way down the back and it looks, you know, incredible compared to that initial starting point. So we'll see uh, how this thing comes out after the press. This will be our standard kind of modern press or, or at least modern for a book from the 80s. So backer board in the center, um, cardstock under the covers, 155 degrees, 15 minutes. And uh, we're going to give this a little bit of hydration. People have asked about this wrinkle. You know, as long as you give your book a healthy but not overdose of moisture before you go into the press you should be able to flatten out all of those wrinkles uh, and somebody asked how long and somebody else asked how long you can let it sit in this state without it being a problem and the answer to that is uh, you know I've done maybe a week maybe 10 days somewhere in there and that's been okay uh, obviously you don't want to leave it permanently in that condition but the trick is just to give it some humidity um, let the humidity loosen up those fibers and then just press it flat so we'll take a peek at this after the press all right, howdy folks. I wanted to give you one more look at this copy of The Amazing Spider-Man 238. This is after the press. And what I wanted to show you is that in that raking glare, it now is flattened out. It looks nice and, and crisp. And you can see it has a nice smooth finish. And most importantly, you know, the, the stains look pretty good there, both on the um, uh, exterior as well as the interior right along here. So, you know, that one turned out quite nice. We're gonna go ahead and get this in its bag and its board for its owner. I'm just gonna slide my bag and board under here. And then we're gonna send this thing on off to the owner to go to CGC. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to report back a nice grade for you when it comes on home. And uh, we'll have to stay tuned from there. While I'm finished things up here, if you could just go ahead and take a quick minute to make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and uh, make sure you're giving us uh, a little bit of attention here and some social media love with those buttons right below the, the video there. So uh, keep your fingers crossed for me, stay tuned, and click the buttons. All right, everybody. The jury is back with a verdict on this copy of The Amazing Spider-Man 238. Uh, this came to me raw, so there's no point of reference, but as you could see in the initial video, it was pretty rough and needed some work. So um, I'm going to go ahead and reveal the CGC grade here, and then we can talk about it. Um, this one was graded by CGC to be a 7.5 copy, uh, universal grade with off-white to white pages. The graders notes noted are light bends to cover, light creasing to cover, light spine stress lines to cover, light wear all corners of cover. Uh, I think the grade was really set by a single light crease um, that was probably about three quarters of an inch. And uh, other than that, I think the other points here really don't affect the grade too much, although there really were several uh, quite noticeable light spine stress lines. Uh, so all in all, I think this one I'm pretty happy with. Uh, I don't always show you the greater notes because most of the time I don't find them the most helpful, but in this case I did want to show you that the greater notes did not uh, indicate staining of any kind, which I think was really important given the initial condition of this book. So I'm going to call that essentially a full, complete, and successful stain removal job. Uh, and so that's going to wrap this one up. What I do want to do, though, is ask you to go back and rewatch that 90s cartoon and make sure every time the hobgoblin's on the screen, you hear the Joker laugh. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and thumbs up.